Well, uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker. This is uh, the morning keynote presentation, uh, a very special uh, woman who's here to talk to us today, Dr. Martha Gulati. Uh, she's Chief of Cardiology at University of Arizona, and she's uh, the Executive Officer of the Heart Institute uh, there in Arizona. And uh, we're so pleased to have her because she is an expert in cardiovascular disease in women. Uh, you've heard a lot from me and, and Dr. Nambi about uh, the risk factors for everybody and, and the treatment for everybody. But now Dr. Galati is going to focus in on what's different about women in, in heart disease. So her title is, uh, aptly enough, is Women in Heart Disease, Is There Really a Sex Difference? Uh, Dr. Martha Gulati, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. It's such an honor to be here and uh, be part of this excellent program. And I, again, I, I get to talk about my favorite topic. So I'm going to start, you know, I mean, even ancient Greeks understood that there was a difference between men and women. And so when they had a god of uh, health, they also assigned a goddess of women's health, and that was Hygiena. And if you know the staff that represents medicine with the snake wrapped up it, Hygiena brought the snake. So women are always associated with the snake, just know that. <laughs> so, but there's a lot of differences between men and women. Sometimes it's how we see ourselves. Sometimes it, it's how we communicate. You know, when men say hi, they just mean hi. When women say hi, we mean so much more than I. So, but maybe, maybe George Carlin said it best. He said, here's all you have to know about men and women. Women are crazy, men are stupid. And the main reason women are crazy is that men are stupid. I'm just quoting a man, so no man in this audience can be actually be mad at me. So, but seriously, let's talk about the sex differences related to the heart. And you can see why we got concerned. You can see these are mortality lines in the United States, the red depicting women and the blue depicting men. And you can see these are mortality trends. And in the 80s, we started seeing declines in mortality in men from heart disease. And a lot of that had to do with guidelines, new medications, statins were introduced at that time. We changed how we approached heart attacks. We opened up blood vessels, got the blood flowing, and our techniques and everything got better. But what we were finding is we didn't really apply these new techniques or these guidelines specifically in women. And so we saw an increase in mortality in women. It was only around 2001 where we started seeing reductions in mortality, and that's that last from that black line onward. Well, in 2001, you might recall that there was a very important trial that came out known as the Women's Health Initiative. That was one of the things that might have changed that trajectory. Prior to that, we thought that hormone replacement therapy was the fountain of youth. I think there was a book called Such a Thing. And people People thought without any evidence that it was beneficial for women, and specifically there was some data suggesting it might reduce heart disease. When we did a trial though, where we actually studied women and put women into trials, we actually found that that wasn't the case. Additionally, what happened in this last decade is we started having guidelines specific to women that people followed. And we also had the Go Red movement. And so, so many things changed in this last decade where we have seen this dramatic reduction in mortality. And in fact, I can tell you in the last two years of data collection, 2013 and 2014, actually less women have died from heart disease than men in the United States, which is great news. You know, the only bad news for both men and women is we started seeing this upswing for both men and women. And we don't know now, we're waiting to see the next year of data that should come out any day now, but whether that is going to suggest that we are now on an increase where the younger generation doesn't outlive their parents' generation. So we'll see what happens with these trends because even though you can't really see it in this line, they both are on the increase for both men and women. 
So of the 1.2 million deaths in the United States, the number one killer, you already heard this, the number one killer is heart disease, and it accounts for just under 400,000 deaths in, of those 1.2 million deaths. That translates into one woman dying from cardiovascular disease every 79 seconds. The next leading cause of death is chronic lung disease, and actually that accounts for about 77,000 deaths. The next leading cause of death is lung cancer, accounting for 70,000 deaths. And the fourth leading cause of death, despite what most women think, is breast cancer, which only accounts for 40,000 deaths in the United States. So if we know that we have a one in three chance of dying from heart disease and stroke, added together, the difference is that for breast cancer, it's one in 38, so just Keep those numbers because women are very aware of the risk of breast cancer and not to minimize it. It's obviously something we can be proactive, that we can get screened for, that we've gotten even better at treating and women come in sooner and sooner. We can do better things because we're very proactive and preventive. We aren't the same with heart disease. If you even think about the number of women living with heart disease in the United States, it's about 47.8 million women in the United States living with heart disease. That's a huge number compared to the 3.1 million women living with breast cancer. And again, this isn't to beat up on breast cancer. It's only to say that we've taught women really well about breast cancer. Why can't we do the same about their number one killer? And again, this is just a way to, that I translate it to my patients that, you know, in terms if you're a 40 year old woman, what is your lifetime risk? You heard about lifetime risk by the previous speaker. And this is the way that we should be thinking about it and, and we sh how we should be proactive about it. But we've really taken this bikini approach to women's health. And, and this, is, comes from, this is a quote from one of my mentors and heroes, Dr. Nanette Wanger, who really started this movement saying we needed to study women's hearts because we really excluded them. When we as the medical community had viewed women's health as the bikini approach, basically looking at the breast and the reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of a woman when we talk about women's health. And we really, despite her saying this in the 80s, we really haven't moved all that far. And I just wrote an editorial last year saying we still haven't moved beyond the bikini. How do we get past that bikini line and really protect a woman's heart? Here's the facts, and you heard a little bit of this from our, our prior speakers, is that you know women live longer than men, so we have to die from something. Well, yes, but well, let's try to live a healthy life, right? The other issue is, is that younger women are more likely to die after a heart attack. So we do less well with the youngest. If they have a heart attack, we often miss it, or we don't aggressively treat it, and they have poorer outcomes. They're the ones with the most to lose. The other issue is until really this past decade, we had excluded women from most of our trials. So a lot of what we learned about heart disease, we really never studied in women until recently. And that might be some of the reason that there's sex differences in um, heart disease. The uh, assumption always was that women were just smaller than men. But that's why we didn't need to study them, because you know they had that pesky problem of getting pregnant, and then they had hormones changes, and how would we account for all that? So that's often the reason that women weren't included in trials. So is it surprising that women do worse than men if we didn't study them? Well, what do we know about women and their hearts? So let's first talk about a little bit of the sex differences in research. And this is a cartoon, but it's really, and I know it was meant in jest, but it's so dead on for heart disease. We have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkey, and men with this condition, but medical research using women as subjects just never really occurred to anyone. And for the number one killer, that was one thing where we left out women. You can see this is just a sampling. I could take so many different papers about this where we look at how many women are enrolled in trials. And the gray bars are how many women were put in these randomized controlled trials, whether the first study was coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension. And you can see very few women were included. Somewhere between 20 to 40% of women were included in the trials, despite the fact that women were either 50% or 
greater in terms of having these diseases um, in our population. So that is a problem when we don't include women in trials. When we do have guidelines, though, so we put out guidelines through our professional societies, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. We put out joint guidelines. And we, the question really is, is do we even follow them adequately in women compared to men? Well, let's look at a little bit of that data. The American Heart Association has this huge data collection, voluntary. The best hospitals give this data. It's called the Get With the Guideline data, and it's just to show how well we're treating our patient population. This is publicly accessible information. Hospitals like to brag about their Get With the Guideline data, and this is fantastic that we've made it easily accessible to our patients so that they can understand when they have a good hospital in their neighborhood you know, that they're being transparent about how good they treat people or how bad, and we learn from it. What this study was, was looking at how well after a heart attack did we treat you. And the middle column that says adjusted odds ratio, if a woman got the treatment as well as a man, the number should be one. If it's greater than one, it means a woman got the treatment more often than a man. And if it's less than one, it means a woman was less likely to get the treatment compared to a man. So you can just see there's not a whole lot of ones, right? Women were less likely to get aspirin or beta blocker, which is life-saving therapy after a heart attack within 24 hours. They were less likely to get any type of invasive procedure, whether that's a cath, whether they needed a cabbage, whether they needed a stent. Women less likely to get it compared with men. We also have these unique measures, which I'll talk a little bit about, about door to balloon time and door to needle time. How quickly can we open up your blood vessel and get the blood flowing to the heart when you have a heart attack? We were less likely to meet these good measures, these measures that we're very proud of in women compared to men. The only thing women did better than men was die. And women were more likely to die if they had this type of heart attack called an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Well. Does that surprise you if we don't get the treatment as adequately or as quickly as men? It shouldn't be surprising at all. We looked at it even further. This, this is one study, and we continue to reanalyze the Get With the Guideline data. And one of the big measures that has really changed us is this door to balloon time. And you know, the, it was in, only in 2006 that they made this public. They, they could not change cardiologists. They're like, there's no way we can get this less than 90 minutes. There's no way. Well, they made the data public. It was on the cover of the New York Times. Guess what? By almost the next year, let alone in the next decade, we got more than 75% of hospitals to achieve a door to balloon time under 90 minutes. So meaning from when you hit the emergency door, the clock starts then to when we open up that vessel. By making it public, you change behaviors. And this is what we need to do more of. But these are measures that we look at. Well, we looked at this again with younger women. We were really concerned about younger women because we were seeing these increased mortality rates in young women who have heart attacks. So this um, young is defined as under 45, which I now will protest, but nonetheless, that's the cutoff now. Um, so I never knew I'd get to be annoyed by those ages. But anyway, under 45, and then we stratified it even further, under 35 and then 35 to 45. And we found it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you, if you were a woman, you were less likely to get the life-saving therapies like ACE inhibitors or ARBs. You were less likely to leave the hospital with lipid-lowering therapies. You were less likely to leave the hospital with controlled blood pressure, that 140 over 90 that you just heard in the previous speaker. Why? That's like something we're supposed to be exceptional at, that we can treat blood pressure. But at discharge, we find women are less likely to have their blood pressure controlled. And again, we were less likely, regardless of age, to achieve these door to balloon times in the younger women, older women, didn't matter. So we continue to watch this. And this was recently, again, republished just a few months ago now, where they looked at it by race and by sex. And again, they showed the exact same trend, um, but race also uh, being African-American meant that you were also, so it was worse to be a woman, but it was worse to be an African-American woman because we did even poorer job 
based on race. So there, there is bias in how we treat people. We need to get rid of that bias. And these are trends that we keep following in the United States. This is the nationwide inpatient sample, again, public data. And we show that women are less likely to get this reperfusion or opening of the blood vessel than men. But the mortality rate is much higher in women. And our length of stay, hospitals care about length of stay. That's what we're being measured on. Women stay in the hospital longer, and that's a problem, but it's probably because we're not treating them as adequately or as aggressively as men. And we have this even in, again, this is just another study called the Virgo trial, which was just a study of young women and young men. And they compared to see how quickly did we open up these vessels. Again, that door to balloon time measure that I told you that should be under 90 minutes. We achieved it. But you can see there was an eight minute gap in women compared to men. Women are shown in red and men are shown in blue. And if they were transferred from another hospital, the gap was even longer and we didn't actually meet the achieved goal for women where we did meet it for men when they're transferred. And that's more for people out in, in rural communities where they might not have that technology in their local hospital, they have to get to another hospital. Time is heart muscle. The quicker we can open and treat them, the better people will do. The other issue is, is that we know that women will get re-hospitalized more than men, and, and younger women more so than, than older women. So these lines, what you can see is the solid line, the solid gray line is women under the age of 55, and the solid black line is men under the age of 55. And you can see very quickly, after they've had a heart attack, they, the rehospitalization rates is what they're measuring there. Women get rehospitalized more, but the younger women get rehospitalized way more than the same age men. Of course, there might be this might be because of differences in care. Might be the difference in medications, the treatments that we talked about, opening up the blood vessel. Might be because we don't refer women as well to cardiac rehabilitation. It may be our follow-up is poor. And we know that for women, there was recent data shown that women at one year after a heart attack tend to not be on those life-saving medications at the same rates that men do. And we don't know the answer for why that is. But it's a cost to our health system, and it's obviously a cost to our society to lose women or to have them lose work days or to be re-hospitalized or even die as a result of a second event. The other issue, though, is do women even experience heart disease like men? And there may be differences in how they present. And there's this term, I don't know how many of you have watched the movie or read the book, Yentl, but Yentl syndrome is something we talk about in the cardiology community because Yentl, the story of Yentl, was she had to disguise herself as a man in order to be taken seriously. She wanted to study the Talmud, and the only way she, a woman could is she had to pretend she was a man. And this was played by Barbara Streisand, and you're going to have the opportunity to hear from the, bar the, the leader of the Barbara Streisand Women Heart Center later today. But this was a story. And the point was Bernadine Healy, who was the first woman who headed up the National Institute of Health, said, do we have to present like men to be taken seriously? Do we always have to present exactly the same? What if we are different? Well, there is some debate. You know, I mean, there's two thirds of women will present the classic way. And this picture is something most of us who went to medical school learned from these netter diagrams where there's so many details hidden into our, um, into these drawings that teach us about presentation. The biggest one is obviously it was a man. Um, and they always depicted heart, heart attacks occurring in men. He was all obviously a businessman. He had a briefcase. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there's a cigarette he dropped in the snow. It's a cold day. He obviously was just at a restaurant and had a heavy meal. And then he's clutching his chest with the classic Levine sign showing that he's experiencing some chest pain or chest discomfort that is classic for a heart attack. Now, two thirds of women will present like that, at least. And that's what we know. But women may have more what we call atypical symptoms. And I hate that term because they may be typical for women. But nonetheless, we're less good at recognizing them. They're certainly important for us to recognize. But I will say there was a very interesting paper that just came out because this last month was heart month. And the, again, that study I talked about, the Virgo trial that looked specifically at younger women, they actually found that there was no difference between men and women, the young men and women, in terms 
terms of their presentation, that over 90% of young men and young women presented with either the reports of chest pain, chest pressure, tightness or discomfort in the chest. And they had women tend to have more other symptoms along with those symptoms. So that, that was also more common. But the classic symptoms that we shouldn't be missing were present in these younger women. So maybe in younger women, they actually are presenting them. Maybe we're just not looking for them. It was interesting, because in this study, what they found is that when the patients presented, they looked at what, what, what did they thought, their, what did they think the symptoms were due to? Men often thought that they were due to muscle pain. Women often were told it was stress or anxiety. And these were people who ultimately went on to have a heart attack. Additionally, um, what brought them to the hospital in the end for um, men, it was more likely that they were concerned about it being their heart. For women, it was less common. Um, for women, it was more common that they thought it was something else going on medically, like maybe complications with diabetes or something like that. They never thought they thought less frequently that this could be my heart. So this was something that we learned from this that we women still aren't that aware that they can have a heart attack. As a result, you can see women, it took them more than six hours to get to the hospital. The majority of them went to the hospital after six hours or more had passed. And remember, time is heart muscle. Additionally, the physician response to me was even more shocking based on when this study took place, is that they went, these were people who, who actually, they, they looked at who went to a primary care physician before they ended up to the emergency room. So if they went to some other doctor, you know, women sought care more than men. That's not surprising. They knew something was wrong. So 29% of them actually sought care compared to 22% of men. But the providers often thought it was something not heart related for women compared to men. So that is really concerning for our healthcare community that we still don't even recognize that these young women can be having heart disease. The other thing is, is that we, you know, we, how we diagnose heart attacks recently, well now, is changing. It's changing real time in front of us. We measure an enzyme that our heart leaks out called troponin. And who would have thought that since women's hearts tend to be smaller than men, that maybe that level or that cutoff is different for women compared to men? Well, the great thing is across the nation, it's already happened in Europe, but how we measure troponin is actually going to be sex specific. And it's rolling out across the country. I know for my hospital, it will change in July. And I think a lot of hospitals are slowly rolling this out. But it will be a cutoff based on women. And what we found from the research that's done in Europe is that we were missing heart attacks in women. The new measure didn't actually make much difference for men. But it did for women. So it's going to be very interesting. But it, again, sex matters. If we don't decide that things matter specific to women or don't look for these differences, we're going to fail half the population. It may be interesting to you, too, to find out that even when women have a heart attack or have a cardiac arrest where people's heart completely stops, and you are out in the public, walking in the street or in the shopping mall, just being a woman means you're less likely to get CPR that there's something about bystanders. They'll see a man fall to the ground, they'll run over and help. They will not do the same for women. And the reason from this one study that came out last year was that they felt that they maybe they would have to touch a woman's breast and that would not be right. And so there was, you know, a lot of, um, we have a lot of work to do about even educating our public because if someone starts CPR, right away you can save lives, but you have to start it. So I love this figure where, you know, breasts are not really involved when you do CPR anyway, but because we have mannequins, even it's called an Annie doll, but she doesn't have breasts. So we don't teach people what they need to do to do proper CPR, and that's part of the problem. And I think that now there's a push to decide to change this so that we can help people, lay public and physicians, so that we can be more effective with treating women and men when they have cardiac arrest. Well, is the disease even the same in men and women? And you're going to hear probably more of this from Dr. Barry Mertz, but so I'm going to just briefly touch on this. But you can see here that there's this male pattern of obstruction. And, and oh, 
uh, sorry, up on the top figure, you, uh, let's see if I can get this to, well, it's no big deal. There's a tight lesion. Looks like somebody took a bite out of a blood vessel. And that's a classic lesion that we know what to do with. And put, we put in a stent and open up that vessel. But for women, it may be in the smaller vessels, the vessels that we don't actually see when we do a cardiac cath, that the disease may be the, at least at the early stages there. That's one suggestion. But there is a potential that it might be different in women, at least at the early stages. And we had this working model that maybe like you already heard from the last speaker, that normal coronary arteries are really in newborns, and then as we progress, you can start having symptoms and signs of atherosclerosis in different ways. But it doesn't necessarily need, mean that you need a tight blockage just to have symptoms. The other thing that may surprise you, though, is when we talk about why when we don't know enough about women, is when we do animal studies or cell line studies before we do clinical studies, do you know that they were using male cell lines and male rats? And really, for some reason, they weren't using women mice or rats or women's cell lines. And it only was brought to the attention in 2014 when this article was written by the NIH leaders, uh, Janine Clayton and Francis Collin, who said, you know, where, why are we not studying at the basic science? Because usually you go from cell to animal to human. We had said to people, if to do studies, you had to include women but we didn't tell the basic scientists that. And so it was only in 2016 that it was mandated that you had to report it and study male and female cell lines as well as animal studies. I don't know if female rats and mice were just more expensive, if they bit the researchers. <laughs> I don't have a good reason why we didn't study them, but that's part of the problem of why we don't have that preclinical studies that help us find out answers that might apply to humans. And you know, mice have that pesky problem too of getting pregnant, just like women. And this is going to only help us to be including both sexes from all our research. So my only point to you is that women are not small men, and there's a lot we still <laughs> need to know. Now, you heard about risk factors, so I'm not actually even going to touch on this because you already just heard about the, some of the unique things of the traditional risk factors. I'm just going to touch on, you know, he talked about the risk calculator, and it's a great way to start the discussion with your primary care physician or your cardiologist if you're working on prevention. We plug in your numbers. We tell you what your risk is. We can tell you your short-term risk and your lifetime risk. We can tell you, you know, if we start a statin, how much will lower your risk for this particular patient, their risk, their 10-year risk was 14.7%. And if I started them on a statin and controlled their blood pressure, the risk went down to 8.1% in the next 10 years. Still high, but better than what it was without treatment. And it's a way to start the discussion. But sex-specific risk factors, as you already heard, don't enter that equation. So what do I think is missing? And I'm going to be brief on this, because I know you're going to hear even more about it. But pregnancy, I will tell you, is nature's free stress test. You know, effectively, there's things that we identify during pregnancy or that occur during pregnancy that may tell us that you're at risk for heart disease. And these are things that we haven't really effectively communicated with patients when they occur. Specifically, the top three are probably the most important. Preterm delivery, gestational diabetes, and any type of hypertension during pregnancy. You may have heard a word called preeclampsia, but even if you have hypertension during pregnancy, that puts you at a higher risk for heart disease. Now, 80% or more of women get pregnant. They bear at least one child. So, and of those, about a third of them will have something called an adverse pregnancy outcome. And these are at least an early stage to help identify women that are at risk for heart disease. And there's a lot of emerging data. This just came out last week, actually, showing what we hypothesize might be happening. Maybe people are already predisposed before pregnancy, but even if they have no risk factors pre-pregnancy, there's something about those events occurring during pregnancy that put you at a higher your risk, not just for the hypertension or diabetes, but also even independent of that, 
for developing heart disease. And we created this infographic through the American College of Cardiology to help relay this to patients and to work with our obstetrics colleagues so that people can know that if you had these complications during pregnancy, to know that you're at risk and that there's things that we can do for you early on because it's in the next 10 years that you have an increased risk of heart disease. So think of the age people get pregnant. They're pretty young women. And then 10 years from them, they're still pretty young women. And that is what we really need to really be preventing heart disease the younger you are. So the other thing is, is it, you know, breast and the heart are really interconnected. And uh, this paper we just wrote was showing all the different things that are related. Part of it is the common risk factors between breast cancer and heart disease but also the therapies for breast cancer are increasing the risk for heart disease. There's also fixed risk factors that we can't change, like you heard about family history, race, age, genes as well that are commonly related to both heart disease and breast cancer. But these are things that we know are increasing the risk of heart disease. And then what we need to be talking to breast cancer survivors about is then the risk of heart disease, because they're more likely to die of heart disease now than they are to die from breast cancer. If they get chest radiation, that increases the risk for heart disease. If they get those chemotherapy, certain chemotherapy for breast cancer increases your risk for heart disease. Now, another medication that's been introduced called Herceptin increases the risk for heart failure. If you get all these medications, it increases your risk even greater. So we need to be talking to women about this because a lot of them focus on their breast disease rather than focusing on something that might kill them. Both of them are important. So my approach to women is this. I, I do work with those um, risk calculators that I already showed you and that you heard about before. And you can you, we start with that. But for women, we need to be very sex-specific and talk about those sex-specific risk factors like the adverse pregnancy outcomes, uh, things like breast cancer and chest radiation, about hormone replacement therapy and menopausal status. Those female predominant conditions like you heard about by the last speaker, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, we should be asking about. And then we need to personalize it for the patient. That, that's the way it starts. We can do all the genetics in the world for you, but if we don't start by asking you know, what's unique for women, we've kind of failed that. That we should be able to discuss without any fancy genetics. So just to leave you with a little thought, you know, breast cancer, you know, the pink ribbon started in 1991 and I saw the Susan B. Komen Foundation outside and, you know, immediately, the next year, that was the universal symbol. And now when any of us see pink, we know its relationship to breast cancer. Well, it was only in 1993 that the Women's Health Initiative that I told you about the hormone trial came out. We had the Y study, you'll hear maybe from Dr. Barry Mertz about that because that was her study and, I, and um, very important trial that we've found out a lot about women and heart disease. Then the Heart Truth campaign only started in 2001 and then the Go Red campaign started and, and we really started releasing guidelines specific to women and yet most people don't even know what the Go Red campaign is despite the fact that the pink symbol and the pink ribbon has been universally adopted. So I think it's time for us to reconsider what do we need to make women understand the risk Given the time that we are at now, it's 2018, and we still have a long way to go. So I think that, you know, we know that only a third of women even talk with their doctor about developing a heart health plan. So we've got to get the other two thirds of women to start talking about that. And that's why I think it's so important to have sessions like this because you guys tend to be the messengers to everyone else to help women understand their risk. So just in conclusion, sex differences, I hope I've convinced you they do exist. Women are definitely understudied and we're just catching up. Women are less likely to receive guideline indicated therapies. Younger women, I hope I've convinced you, are at the greatest risk for poor outcomes after a heart attack. Pregnancy is nature's free stress test. We shouldn't forget that that's a time to talk to women. And remember that 80% of heart disease is preventable if only we'd start working on prevention. We need to screen women for the risk. So I always say that heart disease is the number one killer of women, but lack of awareness is a close second. So thank you again for inviting me here today. Yeah. Yeah.